Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation from uh, KSI, uh, the Strategy Institute for Asia Pacific, uh, to uh, moderate this important session on Malaysian Healthcare Conference 2021, talking about uh, mental health crisis and COVID-19. And definitely one of the key issues that we've been discussing over the past uh, several months of late, really, has been the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the movement restrictions, the lockdowns, the repeated uh, announcements by the government, all on impacting the social economic uh, sector in Malaysia, but very much how the well-being of the people in Malaysia are being affected. It's definitely not something that is unique to uh, this country. Uh, uh, people around the world are experiencing very similar uh, challenges and having to deal with uh, the mental health crisis is something that is uh, of utmost concern, especially when Malaysia was at one point, uh, a couple of years back, was declared uh, unprepared when it comes to the issue of mental health and in fact, uh, did not sufficiently invest in this particular area. So we have a number of questions that we want to be asking our uh, panelists who have already been introduced by Zaim earlier. And we have the questions such as the impact of the pandemic on mental health and the mental health crisis. How do we ensure that people who are in mental health crisis can access COVID-19 safe face-to-face uh, -face support if they need it? Uh, how do we ensure access and improving the quality of mental health uh, crisis services? And moving forward, if we want to be developing and investing, where do we put in the money in terms of national access standards for mental health crisis services? So I'm going to go straight into it. I have a few questions prepared, so I'm going to ask those first, but I would definitely encourage uh, for those who are listening in uh, and watching this, uh, please do send over your questions over to us so that we can have them answered uh, in uh, this panel. So because we at the Galen Center, we take on a patient-centric approach, we are going straight to Juan Anita first uh, uh, to kick off uh, today's session. And the question is to you, you know, we talk about COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic recession, which has negatively affected many people's mental health and created new barriers for people already suffering from mental health. Uh, many of the usual points of care, as we know, have been limited due to lockdowns and movement restrictions. In your association's opinion, since you are the, the founder and president of Mental Illness Awareness and Support Association, what is your opinion on where the state of mental health of Malaysians today, almost 18 months after the first reported case of COVID-19? Go ahead, Ponanita. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Inchi Ezreal, for the question. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon, everyone. First and foremost, uh, thank you very much, KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific, uh, and congratulations for bringing forth this crucial, pertinent, and much needed discussion today, uh, mental health crisis and COVID-19 as part of the Malaysia Health Conference 2021. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for staying on. Um, I believe this is the last session for today for the whole conference actually. Um, the topic of uh, mental health and COVID-19 um, indeed highlights uh, the situation that we are currently in. Uh, not very silent anymore. Uh, mental health uh, pandemic wave is at full force and we must um, really act fast at the moment. So being an NGO on the ground um, in the community closest um, to the people, um, we have seen much um, happening uh, on the ground uh, but first and foremost, I really want to applaud, you know, all the efforts, um, all the initiatives that has uh, that has happened um, throughout this couple of years. Um, finally, mental health uh, being part of the national agenda uh, with the acknowledge acknowledgement of the significance of the NGOs on the ground um, with a special allocation uh, last year via the national uh, budget and also this year. Uh, via the stimulus package, um, 15 million for the expansion of psychosocial support uh, via NGOs on the ground. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this. So um, to answer your question really quickly, um, uh, Azrael, I know we don't have much time. Um, what we have seen is via this pandemic, uh, via this uh, the lockdown measures, it has impacted and worsened the mental health of many. 
um, I think what is um, what is obvious, the people that were you know normal before have now gotten a glimpse of what mental health struggles are. Um, what more people with uh, mental health disorders, people that are struggling, you know, my, our mental health peers on the ground, uh, many have gone through reoccurrence of episodes, many have relapsed, uh, many and most um, of the people that we are serving as part of our um, clients are people in the B40 groups. And the reason for this is because one of the initiatives that Miasa has done, we have provided um, free or um, services at no cost to the B40 group, to the vulnerable groups, to our peers um, in um, uh, on the ground, um, homeless, for example, right? And this uh, is an initiative because many uh, are not able to access these services. So we wanted to break this barrier to access, break the barrier to information. So via having this um, at no cost, people are able uh, to get the services and we're able to help more people on the ground. And I know there's been a lot of movements uh, currently very happy to see everyone, you know, Malaysians coming together um, via, you know, for example, the white flag movement. But really, um, it's not just about uh, food. It's not just about, you know, drinks or hygiene products. It's actually creating a sustainable model, right? Um, it's why, why is it important to break this chain of COVID-19, right? Um, it's not just because we are, you know, losing people to COVID-19, you know, infection rates are high. Um, it is also because we, we need and must break the chain of hopelessness, the chain of despair, you know, suicide risk have increased. So the chain of suicide contagion, the chain of suicide copycats, people are dying on the ground because of this. So a sustainable model needs to happen. Um, you know, um, as Tantri uh, mentioned earlier, um, private and public sectors working together. I do believe that um, if we are not able to prioritize in terms of funding, we should be able to redistribute the current resources, the existing resources that we have, so that you know people in the community do get the help that they need. Because a lot of the money that is pumped into mental health are all given, or, or the majority of it, are given to mental institutions, which is, which only serves you know one percent of people with mental health conditions. So what happens to you know the ninety nine percent of people in the community that are, for example, going through anxiety, depression, and other uh, mental health disorders? And again, um, also continuum of care because not everyone needs um, you know intensive clinical intervention. Hence why the helplines I feel have been really beneficial. Uh, and I know um, yesterday our health minister has already spoken a, a little bit about it. Um, you know, we've seen about 140,000 uh, phone calls coming in via the psychosocial uh, support line via MOH Mercy, um, uh, the Talian Kasi, uh, Jack Kim's helpline uh, from March last year till I think it was Ma uh, May uh, this year. But what about the NGOs on the ground that we're not highlighting where, you know, for example, like us at Miasa and our friends on the ground uh, from August last year after RMCO happened till July 2nd this year, we have gotten 50,000, um, everyone, 50,000 people reaching out for the help via calls, via WhatsApp, via email, via social media, virtual session and hybrid sessions. And we are stretched very thin at the moment. Very, very happy last year when WHO came out with, um, you know, the tagline mental health for all greater investment, uh, greater access, because this is exactly what needs to happen because mental health has been left, um, you know, okay. furthest in society being neglected and we need to do something uh, about it and we need to act fast. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, th thank you, Ponanita. And I think uh, many of the points that you touched on provides excellent opening points for us to, to uh, pick up on with our uh, next few speakers, especially on the issue of budgeting, the kind of access services, the kind of needs, but also the point here that, you know, we talk about the sustainable development goals, but not leaving anyone behind. But when you look at the issue of mental health, you just said it just now that it seems that when it comes to mental health, it's falling behind uh, when yep. you compare to everything else, right? Exactly. So I'm going to go to uh, Dr. Ko, Dr. Eugene Ko, who comes from us uh, from University of Putra, Malaysia. And you're a psychiatrist, Dr. Ko, and obviously as a, a, a provider, a health provider yourself, uh, being a professional in, in the uh, mental health space, what's your opinion? How do you respond to some of the issues that 
Juananita just raised a moment ago. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you actually for the opportunity. I, I would say, I would start off first to say that mental health is actually a complicated um, issue. It, it's not as simple as if I see diabetes, I look at it as an illness, I only address it as an illness. I would say that it comes it affects a lot, a lot of factors. It comes from a lot, a lot of um, angles that we do need to look. Um, one of the biggest questions that I always tend to ask myself, and I do know among the professionals we also ask, are we seeing an increase in mental health awareness or are we seeing an increase in mental health conditions? Two very different things. As more and more movement starts coming up with, with regards to mental health awareness, the work that Puan Anita does with her NGO and so and many, many other NGOs, as more and more of these movements come into play, appears more and more in the media, mental health awareness is going to increase. And as such, people are going to be more and more aware that they, the psychological impact, you know, mental health itself, how it's affecting them, they're going to be more aware of it. And as such, they might start considering, do I have a condition? It doesn't, but that doesn't reflect to them developing eventually to a mental illness. That's the first thing I would actually respond to what was just mentioned. Are we actually seeing an increase of mental health awareness, which results in an increase of using mental health related resources, such as the NGOs and the supports? Or are we actually seeing a very severe COVID related um, mental health condition or crisis, which leads to many, many um, mental health illnesses increase? And one of the other points I want to point out is that um, while we were worried that when the pandemic hits, um, people are going to develop more and more mental health conditions, we actually didn't see that in 2020. Um, feedback, uh, anecdotal feedback, you know, when we ask around from the other hospitals, um, we do get more and more patients relapse, but we don't actually see a very significant increase in the prevalence. We did see that um, when the MCO happened in 2021, we did see a jump into it, but we kind of also expected that because our situations has gotten more and more worse. The numbers, cases of numbers have gotten more and more. Um, the social economic factors has come more and more. And we do know in times where all of this contributes to someone unable to fulfill their basic needs, it causes a lot of distress. And when there's a lot of distress, naturally, uh, some of them will actually end up developing mental conditions. So uh, I, I, I'd be a bit cautious to kind of interpret this, um, this whole picture. I do agree. I do agree that uh, we have a lot, a lot more to work on. I do agree that um, we are getting more and more people who are aware, more and more who, people who goes into this to give support to work on it. Um, but I also would say that we do have a system currently, um, at least within the urban areas, the major cities, the rural cities do have a lot to work on too, but at least within the urban cities, we do have a lot of resources that kind of able to provide some form of mental health intervention when necessary. And this is not just from a psychiatrist perspective. Um, I know the public health are actively, actively involved, in the KKMs and all this, they, they have a whole section developing and they have come out with various um, methods to reach out mental health to the public, not through a psychiatry center. Our clinical sehatans, um, all the staff are actually trained to do some form of screening to kind of support them. They might not be able to provide very adequate or intensive treatments like perhaps a psychiatry center is, but they are trained enough to kind of screen, to kind of offer basic support and then go on. And on top of that, from a community level, I think, um, as Juanita rightly pointed out, more and more NGOs, more and more um, public initiated movements are coming up. And from there, um, we are get able to reach out to the public and more and more support to build up with that. Overall, I would say that, uh, again, this is a very complex, complicated picture. Um, I wouldn't dichotomize it to as very bad and very good, but I will want to consider all aspects of this before we consider, um, before we move on, before we plan a framework to actually support this, all right? I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Aruf. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ko. And, and certainly a lot of people have been trying to understand where we are on the issue of mental health and how it uh, is positioned with regards to COVID-19. And um, it is still a developing situation. All we see are the consequences of uh, neglect of mental health or us not addressing problems and uh, some of the consequences that we're starting to see are, are uh, things like sleep deprivation, uh, people are not getting enough rest. It seems like we're working all hours of the day. <laughs> you know, previously we had separations in terms of where we are 
in terms of work, where we are at home, where we are in terms of sleep. Now, honestly speaking, I'm sometimes sending emails at 1 a.m. I, I also don't know why I'm sending these emails. But the point is, is that our mental health is actually being affected due to the fact that we have no longer these kind of borders or even protections that are put into place to help us deal with it. So I want to ask Dr. Wanalia over there, who's uh, also from UPM, uh, where and how can, where are the main problems that you see in terms of us dealing with uh, rest and especially when it comes to mental health and most importantly, what can we do about it? Go ahead, doctor. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Azrul, for a very important question. So please allow me to share some of my PowerPoint slides. I promise it's very simple slides. Is it possible to share my screen? All right, so can everyone see the slides here? We can see. All right, that's great. So as a neurologist, actually I'm a backbencher of the mental health, but I see the bad outcomes that can come from it. So, but I'm very honored to give some input on how the pandemic can have an impact on our mental health focusing on sleep, which is the most important neurobiological component to restore our physical and mental health. So I'll be addressing these three main issues on the challenges on how to get a good sleep and the importance of sleep and what are the steps to improve our sleep uh, during these trying times. So we just, I would just like to share a, a recent patient that I saw in my clinic. So I have a young gentleman, Mr. Chris, who's a 30-year-old bank exec and had been having trouble sleeping for the past six months so it has come to a point where he couldn't focus at work having frequent tension headaches and his working performances had been negatively impaired so um, I hope this is not new Ms. Azra. so uh, it's Mr. Chris case is an isolated case of insomnia since the starting of this pandemic so I'm sure that this is certainly not as a recent meta-analysis published uh, in the Lancet Journal, which is the most esteemed medical journal around, which um, uh, they had studied about 168 studies. And uh, the author found that the sleep problems are very prevalent uh, during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And sleep problems are associated with mental health disorders, such as depression and anxiety. So what are really the challenge to sleep during a pandemic? So basically, there are a few important factors that we should be aware of, all right? But of course, we know that millions of people suffered from insomnia before the coronavirus itself. And unfortunately, the pandemic creates a host of new challenges, even for people who previously had no sleeping problems at all. So there's a new term where we call coronasomnia that refers to sleep problems related to the pandemic now. Certainly, there's a definite impact on our sleep and mental health due to these factors. First is the disruptions of our daily life. You name it, social distancing, school closures, quarantines, and working from home. These all bring profound changes to our normal routines. Therefore, keeping track of the time can be hard without typical time anchors, like dropping kids at school or arriving at the office. In addition, being stuck at home, especially if it has low levels of natural light, this may reduce light-based cues for wakefulness and sleep, which are crucial to our circadian rhythm. Uh, second is anxiety and worry. We know that the economic concerns are affecting nearly everyone as well. And as economic activity stalls and job losses mounts, it's normal to worry about income, savings, and making ends meet. So this all anxiety will bring us uh, to a point of anxiety that disrupts the sleep as a racing mind keeps the body tossing and turning and this makes sleep uh, challenging at night. Third is the depression and isolation. So this crisis can trigger feelings of isolation and depression that may be even worse for people who have a loved one who is currently admitted to the hospital or ICU due to COVID-19. Grief and depression actually can be exacerbated by isolation at home, and both are known to have a potential to cause a significant sleeping problems. Researchers reported that the rates of depression actually triple in this pandemic, while a decrease in sleep and an increase in substance abuse such as alcohol, tobacco use, 
this will lead to spikes in rates of depression as well. Number four is greater family and work stress. So I'm sure that everyone is very aware of the WhatsApp uh, picture that has been viral recently. So keeping up with work from home obligations or managing a house full of children who are accustomed to being at school can actually pose real problems, generating stress and discord that have been shown to be the barriers to sleep. Number five if, is the excess screen time, especially later in the evening. This can have a very detrimental impact on our sleep. Not only it can stimulate the brain in ways that make it hard to win down, but the blue light from screens can suppress the natural production of uh, melatonin, a hormone that the body makes us uh, to sleep. And lastly, the stress-related fatigue. The Mayo Clinic defines fatigue as a nearly constant state of weariness that develops over time and reduces your energy, motivation, and concentration. So even if you receive an adequate amount of sleep at night, fatigue can still leave you feeling tired and unmotivated uh, in the morning. So why actually sleep is important during a pandemic? So again, I would like to highlight that sleep is a critical biological process. And as we juggle the mental, the physical, and the emotional demands of the pandemic, it's more important than ever getting a consistent, high-quality sleep which will improve all aspects of our health, which is why is it worthy of our attention during this pandemic. For example, sleep empowers an effective immune system, a solid nightly rest, strengthen our body's defense, and a study had shown that lack of sleep can actually make some vaccines less effective. Sleep also can increase the brain functions, and it can... Um, and lack of sleep itself can make a person irritable and cause or worsen the feelings of depression. So in overall, sleep can improve the mental health. And sleep also is linked to other mental health conditions uh, such as anxiety, bipolar, and uh, PTSD. So if you, if you can allow me to give a bit of introduction on sleep itself. Uh, Prof. One, if we could just... Uh... Uh, speed it up a bit. We have to go to the questions as well. All right, sure. Yeah. So I just like to highlight that um, there's two main components in sleep, which is the quantity and the quality. So I'm sure everyone knows about the quantity, but uh, some of us are not aware of the importance of the quality of sleep. So this is a normal sleep architecture that we encounter every night. So in a normal sleeping pattern, we have uh, four stages of sleep. Right, uh, which is considered of a non-REM sleep and a REM sleep. And this is just to show an anatomy of our brain that plays the role in the neural circuits of wakefulness. And this is what happened in our brain that, that is responsible for our sleep itself. And these are the stages of what we call non-REM sleep, which is very important. Uh, uh, stage three and four is our deep sleep, which is... Um, the time when our physical body is trying to repair itself. So it's during uh, this deep sleep. And the REM sleep is responsible to repair our cognition and our mental health states. All right, so I, I, I pass back to you. I didn't understand that. Uh, thank you, Prof. And, and certainly uh, there were really some very interesting points that you highlighted in your presentation, which reminds me of how possibly sleep deprived some of us are and the importance of that sleep in terms of managing that uh, uh, process of carrying us through this pandemic, you know, and, and the fact that we need to look at it in the long term. Um, speaking of sleep deprived, uh, we go to Dr. Alisi over there. Uh, thank you so much for, for holding on and for waking up so early, apparently. <laughs> so, uh, Absolute honor to be here. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. Uh, well, thank you. And I want to go straight to it. Uh, you know, you work in health systems, uh, information management systems. And one of the issues that we are about to deal with really is the national budget. And when you look at the Malaysian national budget, we saw the psychiatry and mental health services in public health care, which is dependent on for the majority of the population, uh, actually decrease uh, from uh, 31 million ringgit to, uh, uh, sorry, it decreased by 9.1%, uh, which was 31 million from 344 million in 2020 to 313 million in 2021, 
which made us actually less funded uh, entering into the second year of the COVID-19 pandemic compared to the previous one. And the lowest amount this has been since 2017, and arguably the steepest budget cut when you compare to this area of healthcare over the last decade. So the question I have to pose to you, Dr. Lisi, is does it matter? Uh, how much does this public funding uh, have an impact on actual access and availability to healthcare services? And most importantly, because we are about to enter the next budget discussions, uh, there's a lot of uh, debate that's going to go uh, into parliament, but also uh, we need a message that's made clear to the policymakers and the parliamentarians. What should we say that's needed for the next budget when it comes to mental health? Over to you, sir. Thank you. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, 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 if, you, if you stop and reflect for a minute, what's happening in Malaysia in terms of mental health, and I was listening really intently to um, uh, the previous speakers in terms of where we are, and what processes we've put in place to try to assuage the worst effects uh, of this pandemic. Uh, Malaysia is not that different to anywhere else, insofar as mental health has been relatively underfunded. In terms of the state contribution to mental health uh, in, in, in uh, countries that have um, uh, state systems, uh, has actually been reducing rather than increasing uh, over the past few years. But we really need to look at what the effect of the pandemic is um, uh, in terms of strengthening our arguments, because if there's one thing this pandemic has done, as well as, of course, affect uh, uh, the whole population, it's, it's highlighted the inequalities which exist within that population. Uh, we know that people who have um, uh, 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 the harder to reach populations, the people with multimorbidities, the people who have a whole host of different non-communicable diseases have a far worse uh, outcome uh, to COVID uh, than people uh, who don't. Not only do they tend to get this condition more, but they also tend to die in larger uh, numbers. Um, and all, all the pandemic has done is highlight what we already knew. And what we already knew is we are not reaching the whole of the population anywhere in the world, uh, and we are not dealing with all the issues which need to be dealt with. And mental health, of course, comes uh, up in spades in terms of what is not dealing with. We haven't gone into what's going to happen in the future, and that perhaps is another question you could ask me, but um, uh, we certainly are, are missing out on a dimension because, of course, uh, there is no health without mental health for all. But there are some other things that happened in the pandemic, uh, as well as the exacerbations to existing conditions uh, associated with the fact that we withdrew treatment, uh, um, uh, partly because of the focus um, of care uh, on COVID, which inevitably is going to have significant effects over a period of time. We also are now dealing with a really quite um, affected workforce, and I'm talking about the health and care workforce uh, of, um, uh, of our countries, because the fact that they were dealing with the pandemic has actually significantly affected them as well. So now we not only have a population uh, which is um, uh, clearly in need of treatment, not only do we have um, uh, uh, the effects of COVID upon um, uh, most people because of the work-home balance being disturbed, but we also now have um, a workforce that needs treating as well, and treating in, in pretty large numbers the effects of depersonalization, the effects of burnout, often exhibit um, uh, initially in mental health disorders. And these need treatment, and need treatment really quite, quite um, uh, significantly. <clears throat> Hence, I think the arguments for ensuring that we manage our um, uh, mental health better uh, in future years is, 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 is clearly the time, it's clearly the time to make those arguments now. 
this is the time when we have most evidence on our side in terms of the effect upon the population, because we can see it. The fact there are significant inequalities, because we can see them. Uh, and the fact that non-communicable diseases in general have actually not done terribly well um, uh, associated with this pandemic. So COVID has not only affected the COVID populations, but also affected the non-COVID populations. Um, and in some countries, the effect of that has been even greater than the effect of COVID itself. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Alicia. That's uh, quite a really interesting opening salvo from you. I'm going to pick up on some of those points that you mentioned and uh, bring it over to, doc, uh, to, to Juan Anita over there. Uh, Dr. Alicia mentioned uh, about inequalities and arguably there's a lot of inequity that has not only been uh, highlighted, it's actually widened during this period of, of the COVID-19 crisis. And one of the things that uh, we are wanting to understand is, is whether or not some of these services, these health uh, crisis services are available, mental health, sorry, mental health uh, crisis services are available, but are they also affordable? And what we see is, is that even though in the private sector, it is possible to access some of these uh, services, they could be uh, an additional cost for people who during this time are unable to afford those kind of, of services. And it's considered almost a, a, a luxury even to consider your own state of well-being, your mental health, as opposed to more existential concerns like food, you know, bringing uh, income to the table to be able to ensure that your family is able to sustain during a period of unemployment. There's a lot that's happening today and a lot for people to manage how do you help people who are needing access? And the problem here is, is that a lot of these uh, services are being provided by uh, the public health sector, which provides them at low cost. It is available, but they're also limited. And during this time where COVID-19 is a concern, it may be a deterrent for people to actually go to the service centers or the hospitals where these services are based. So, uh, what's your opinion, Ponanita, on the issue of, of the inequality and inequity that has been highlighted and even widened during this period? Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Inch Ezreal. Um, that's a very important question. Um, I think one of the good, uh, great things that has happened uh, via this pandemic is actually the birth of telehealth. Um, so I believe that even um, NGOs on the ground, what, what we are currently doing is we are strengthening our telehealth. Um, you know, even for Miasa, all our services, we have migrated them online. So people are able to access, for example, peer support, counseling, um, mental health assessment, um, clinical assessment, therapy, um, art therapy, alternative, um, you know, non-medical alternatives that we also provide to people. Um, I think one of the other ways um, that we will be able to break this barrier is if we provide and move towards task shifting. And I talk a lot about task shifting because um, this has been proven um, outside of Malaysia, right? So if we are able to task shift and empower the community, then other people and many people can become a resource. So people in the community can get the help that they need because again, not everyone needs uh, clinical intervention. So like you mentioned, right? Um, a lot of people are feeling it, not just, pe not just um, people with mental health uh, conditions or disorders, but the normal people, people that weren't struggling, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, need, needing emotional support or psychosocial support. So obviously, via this pandemic hit, the lockdown measures that has happened, um, you know, social isolation, the economic impact, people being cut off from um, being able to do their um, effective coping mechanisms, be it seeing family or uh, going out, um, traveling, or just doing, you know, running or um, cycling at the public parks, etc. Um, so these, these are some of the things um, that I think will really help 
uh, for um, the community to get the help that they need. Uh, and one of the other things um, that is possible at the moment is to leverage on our um, public um, public health network, of course. Um, you know, we've got uh, GPs, uh, six, 7,000. We've got health clinic clinics at the moment, 1,000 plus. Um, if we're able to train, um, we, if we're able to provide, you know, uh, mental health assessments, which I know some are able to do it, but not many yet. Um, and uh, via the um, research that was conducted, um, I think it was in 2016 by Health Systems Research, Harvard University and MOH, 49% of Malaysians, when they are going through a mental health struggle, who do they see? Their first point of contact are GPs. So if we're able to leverage on our primary care, sorry, our primary care network, uh, then a lot of people can get the help that they need. So really there are resources. Uh, we just need to get um, people trained. Um, just a, just minimal training and what we've seen working on the ground, uh, providing some quick wins that we've seen are providing practical tips. You know, a lot of people that reach out for the help, what do we do? We provide them um, how to how to do um, deep breathing exercises, you know, uh, relaxation techniques, for example, grounding techniques, those things really provide a lot of help to people because you know people go through anxiousness anxiety you know there's a lot of uncertainties happening a lot of people feel panicky um uh, you know Anita, can i yeah. just pick, pick up on that point there just now yeah. uh, that you mentioned about people wanting and and they needing to to get these services and support uh, we have a question here from uh, someone who's asking you know, because there's so much dependence on online, and you, you spoke just now about teleconsultations through online services yep. and support. So you have a lot of psychosocial support services that are shifting online. How, how do you imagine, sorry, how, do you, how would you like that the B40 community uh, and the rural population access those online services? Are those provided and are right. they available for them? I know right. a lot of people depend on WhatsApp groups over here yeah. <laughs> and they tend to get a lot of good support, but they also get a lot of not so good support. So right. when it comes to, uh, for these populations, how would you recommend? Go ahead, Juan. Yeah. Um, okay, so for, for I think, uh, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of the services are very much concentrated in Klang Valley, even NGOs. Um, so if we can empower, um, you know, these NGOs, um, you know, health clinics uh, nationwide, then a lot of people will be able to access the help that they need. Uh, because even for us, we have our crisis team, just to give you an example, and a little bit of insights, 150 people manning um, our helplines, we're able to mobilize them. So our team can actually go on site to where the, the person is in crisis. So we can go and help our homeless friends on the ground. We can actually go to the uh, rural areas to help them. So if we're able to do this, then of course B40s can access these services. So I know that there, you know, we always say there's limitations in terms of human resources, be it psychiatrists, be it psychologists. But if we can get some of them to go to the rural areas, train the health clinics, people in there, then obviously um, the B40s will be able to access these services. And I think the other barrier, um, to Azrael, is actually um, the barrier to information. So the mental health literacy is very poor when it comes to, um, you know, the rural areas, even in the urban areas. You know, can you imagine we are still talking about sign and symptoms? You know, the question really is not just about I have a mental health disorder, what do I do about it? The true question that we really need to be talking about, I have a mental health disorder, I've already gone through my recovery process, how do you reintegrate me into society? Are we ready? Are we accepting? Okay you know, stigma, discrimination, what's happening, you know, we need supported accommodation, we need supported employment, you know, so all these things needs to happen. So like you mentioned, social determinants of health, we need to focus on that. Okay, thank you, Puan. Uh, Professor, um, you know, we talk a lot about mental health and you spoke about the importance of sleep and rest, especially mm -hmm. during this time of crisis. But I'm reminded of the fact that you know, um, though we as civilians who are non-healthcare professionals uh, in the healthcare space uh, are able to get maybe six hours or maybe five hours, or even if we're even privileged to have eight hours of sleep, our colleagues over there who are working in the ICU wards, who are providing the kind of, of care for the people who are uh, hooked up onto ventilators, who are doing the testing, who are at the CACs, 
at the COVID assessment centers who are, who are basically the frontliners who are working around the clock yeah. in terms of providing the kind of response that Malaysia, you know, we take for granted sometimes, you know, the fact that these people are there and they are working very often without some backup. There are no cavalry, there's no reinforcements that are coming to relieve them, it's just them. How about their state of, of rest, well-being, and most importantly, their mental health? Uh, if you could uh, comment, Professor, go ahead. It's really a spot-on question, Mr. Azrul. So um, remember the Lancet um, uh, journal that has published recently, a, a meta-analysis study comparing 168 studies worldwide in 40 countries. So they did find that um, sleep problems firstly affected actually the post-COVID-19 patients. So surprisingly, patients after the COVID, they don't recover 100%. They have this what we call long COVID or post-COVID syndrome, whereby 58% of these patients are uh, having really bad sleeps. And then the next uh, populations being affected uh, with the sleep problems are actually the frontliners that you have clearly said. So with the shift system that uh, we are using now, so uh, most of the system they use that 12 hours shift. So of course they will, this will affect on their circadian rhythm. So when they're doing the night shift, they don't have the daytime cues, they don't get the proper sunshine. So this will affect the the body system to, to, to adjust uh, during their night shift work and then changing to the morning shift work. So about 30% of the frontliners actually having the sleep problems. And when they're having sleep problems, uh, they are associated with uh, the mental health uh, disorders such as uh, depression and anxiety. So this is some something that we have to give our attention on to, to really help these, these populations on how to improve their sleep so that their mental health uh, can be improved as well. So thank you, Mr. Azrul, for pointing out on this. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Ko, I have two questions for you. Uh, it's coming in from uh, our colleagues out there. Uh, first of all, you know, we don't speak about young people that often. We think of they're resilient, they're young. Where's the problem? We're talking about mostly middle age, older people, but they tend to be much more tough and, and, and resilient you know, but everybody's vulnerable. And the fact is, is that we're seeing more and more concern, uh, problems of mental health crisis amongst young people. So uh, in terms of, well, in your opinion, what do you see as three possible uh, concerns or factors that are affecting them during this, this period of crisis uh, of young, for young people? And the second question uh, is really, if you could comment a little bit on the online services, I think, uh, would be good picking up the point that was raised earlier by Ponanita. Go ahead, Dr. Correct. Uh, let, let's start with the second question first. I think that's a bit easier. Um, there was a study, a national survey that was done in 2018 and then 2019 on the number of people who have access to the internet. Um, that number actually gradually increased. It's a national survey, by the way. 90% uh, of the country um, population has access to internet. We're not talking about having a fancy smartphone. We're not talking about having a fancy computer. Uh, people who have access to those is only about 30% from that same survey. But 90% of the population have some form of access to the internet. A lot of them are very well versed with using the internet to source out resources and also to socialize. Why I'm putting this up is that because keeping that in mind and keeping um, considering what online therapy is or what online um, healthcare services are. As long as someone who could access the internet, most likely through a phone, you don't need a fancy handphone to access the internet, but as long as they could access that, some form of mental health support could be provided. You don't necessarily need to, you know, have a face-to-face, -face, use a Zoom account and kind of chat. It could be a phone call. It could be an internet voice call. It could be a Zoom call without video. So to kind of address that earlier question that was asked to us on the internet, so online services, I think um, a huge percentage of our population can access it with regards, even if it's B40, a huge percentage of them can access it. Um, but maybe it's not accessing it in the same manner that we commonly have, you know, sit in a comfortable room, have a nice Zoom call chat. It could be as simple as having a phone call or um, various others version of that. It could be as simple as sending an email and kind of find out what are the routes they can do for health seeking. So, um, I would say that 
online services for healthcare is still accessible to a certain extent, even for B40, um, but not to all. We do need much, much more work on that. Uh, we do need to increase the access that includes everyone in the B40 or even the rest of the population. Um, and that's just my comment on that. Uh, with regards to the other questions, with regards to youth, um, I'm, I'm going to state here first, I'm, I'm not a youth specialist. So I'm going to only be able to answer it from a very, very general sense. I would say youth are also uh, humans. They would experience the same amount of distress that an uh, adult would go through with regards to the changes that the pandemic has brought upon, except the sources of their changes would be a bit different. They would have to learn to adapt on how to sit in front of a computer to educate, to go through education. They would need to learn how to adapt, how to so so socialize, if any. Most of them are probably cut off from their friends and socializing gets affected. They will need to get a debt, in fact, being with their parents who are working from home all day, all night with them. And of course, you know, given the stress from working from home and all this, that's going to cause them to be stressful also, and that might actually encounter issues with that. If they come from a family that is extremely um, dysfunctional or problematic, they will end up being exposed to those um problematic issues much more than previously, because previously they probably had the chance to go to school to escape from it. And there are many, many more factors, but those are just some general ones that off my mind okay. I could think of. And I think um, it will eventually affect and impact and cause an increase in mental health issues or mental health wellness. Okay. Th thank you, Dr. Ko. Uh, Dr. Alisi, uh, we're coming to the end of the session. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time for for us to uh, elaborate further on some of the points that we discussed. But I have to go to you with an important question moving forward uh, beyond this session. And, and that is about future-proofing uh, Malaysia's healthcare system uh, in the area of mental health. Um, and to address uh, I, I one of the critical issues that uh, Prof. Wan commented earlier and has been raised in a question here is building support systems in the community as well for frontliners where now we're suddenly seeing a huge demand for mental health services, but we are facing limited resources and trained personnel. So if you were to give a recommendation in terms of future proofing uh, the system for mental health, what would you say is best in terms of where the money should be put in and what should we invest in? Go ahead, Dr. Lisi. Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you for the question. I mean, it really hits it, it really goes to the heart of the arguments we're making today around the importance of mental health. If we look at the global burden of disease, uh, we know that the situation is changing. And this is irrespective of COVID. We know that um, people of my generation are the generation of cardiometabolic disorders, are the generation uh, who uh, age and end up in situations where they have uh, uh, hypertension, they have um, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, etc. Younger generations tend to behave a little bit differently. And for a while, we thought, uh, perhaps um, um, we hoped rather, that we had seen the end of this uh, epidemic of non communicable disease, which we were seeing. But to a degree, that's been replaced by a, an increase in mental health disorders. So I think in terms of future proofing, uh, we need to understand that mental health disorders are going to increase in importance over the next 20 or 30 years rather than decrease in importance. So the emphasis on mental health needs to increase rather than decrease. But having said that, um, because of course, the moment you say that you think, oh, now how on earth am I gonna cope with this? It's difficult enough. Uh, to cope with physical disease, now I have to cope with mental disease, and actually it's increased in priority. Uh, the way we manage care is also changing, and we need to embrace that change in the way we manage care. We talked about the importance of outreach in the community uh, to reach different parts of the population, um, and we have wonderful opportunities uh, with digital transformation to ensure we reach as much of the population as possible. Um, using um, uh, uh, telehealth, yes, uh, training people in how to use telehealth, by the way, because telehealth is not, not just a translocation of a face-to-face -face contact uh, to uh, a two-dimensional image, 
but also using all the potential of telephone, text, um, uh, and everything else to go with it, as well as the occasional face-to-face, -face, uh, to really have a, a, you know, an omni-channel approach to, to, to managing mental health. And I think within that is our future. Uh, but having said all that, for that to happen in terms of the future, there's one thing we really need, and that's the ability to have interoperable systems, um, the ability to have digitally um, empowered uh, data, and the ability, of course, to start to personalize care for the individual. And there's no other way to do that other than using the power of data and information uh, to improve healthcare. So there needs to be some investment in the infrastructure of our health and care systems to enable all these changes, which also need to take place um, uh, uh, to go ahead. So I think even though the, the future looks threatening in some respects because uh, of all the extra priorities, I think because of the way we can change the way we manage health and care, uh, we can see more people with less. And that, of course, is a significant advantage. Thank you, Dr. Alessi, and, and very well said, I must say, in terms of where the investment should go, and but also the fact is, is that mental health, uh, the demand for mental health services is not decreasing, but actually increasing and probably be on magnitudes higher than what we have today. I, we're coming to the end of the session, but I wanted to give one minute to Juan Anita uh, to give uh, the final words for the session today. Go ahead, Juan Anita. You have one minute. Thank you very much, uh, Jezreel, and thank you very much to all the panelists and everyone that, uh, uh, that is here today. Um, I just want to say I would like to end this with um, let's prioritize mental health, uh, because I think we all know that one day COVID-19 will end. Uh, mental health disorders, mental health struggles will definitely outlive COVID. So we need to um, continue um, prioritizing mental health, expand the community, mental health services, um, provide funding in this area so that no one is left behind. Because truth be told, if you are on the ground, accessing services for the B40s and the vulnerable groups and the youth is very challenging. So we need to build back better. Um, and I hope we can do this together. Thank you very much, um, Azro, and thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Puananita. Build back better. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> uh, thank you to all of our speakers uh, for the session uh, today. Uh, Puananita Baka, uh, our distant colleague over there, Dr. Charles Alisi, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Wan Alia, uh, Wan Sulaiman, and of course, Dr. Eugene Ko Bunyao. Thank you all for participating in the session uh, today as part of the Malaysian Healthcare Conference 2021.